The Unshackled Waves, episode 164. Broadcasting from Melbourne, Australia, this is The Unshackled Waves with Tim Wills. Brought to you by theunshackled.net. Hello everyone, great to have your company. Now we are told by the Turnbull government that the economy is strong and that they have delivered on their promise of jobs and growth. However, wage growth is stagnant and there are still fits of uh, stock market turbulence. Some believe since the lessons of the 2008 global financial crisis have not been learned, we have created the conditions for another global financial crisis. One person who believes we could be on the verge of another crisis is John Adams, who is a former advisor to Liberal Senator Arthur Zinedinas, uh, and he was also a policy officer at the Department of Finance, and he is now a management consultant for a big four accounting firm. His economic analysis has been featured in News Corp publications, and he has appeared on the ABC program The Drum, and has also written political commentary for The Spectator Australia, and he joins us in the studio tonight. John, thanks for your time. Thank you very much. Now, there's a lot of people who warn of uh, financial, economic uh, Armageddon. You first started writing about this in February uh, 2017, and uh, as I mentioned, through a series of news.com.au articles. Yeah. Uh, that's, uh, because uh, I come from a libertarian background, they're always libertarians are always saying doom is just around the sure. the, the corner. But yeah. what, why why are you right this time? Sure, sure. So so yes, yeah, so, so so I've been warning about uh, what I would describe as structural uh, imbalances in the Australian economy since uh, May of 2016, first in the telly and then starting on, on News. dot com in January of 2017. And uh, what what. I mean, what what we have at the moment is, uh, you know, the greatest household debt bubble in the history of the country. So think about we've had two depressions in Australian history, uh, 1890, 1929, uh, and the debt levels today are higher than the preceding periods of the 1880s and the 1920s. Um, and so what I've been trying to do in a number of these columns is actually go into the data, actually figure out what's really going on and to present a case to policymakers and the Australian people about, um, you know, that that the economy is not uh, structurally sound. It's not a normal looking economy. It's actually quite sick. It's got massive cancer. And if we don't do something about it, um, it's going to blow up and hundreds of thousands, if not millions of Australians are going to be severely affected economically as a result of the consequences of an international shock. Because in Australian history, We've had complacency, she'll be right, and then something overseas blows up in the international economy and we get swept right through it. That's what happened in the two depressions. And obviously when I've looked at economic history, looked at the current data, things look, things look pretty bad. And this is why I've been writing these columns that Armageddon um, is coming. Now, uh, house prices in Australia, they're, they're always a big uh, political issue and there's, there's often the expression, uh, a mortgage to the, to the hilt. Yeah. Uh, but uh, you argue that this underline this, uh, it's, it's mainly this household debt. It's because of uh, house prices are taking out uh, massive mor uh, mortgages. It's, uh, what is, is it simply a supply issue or an immigration issue or is it something more systemic than that in the system? So, 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 so that's a great question. So the establishment and the mainstream political parties and the banks and the real estate industry, they're all saying that it is um, things to do with real factors. It's immigration, it, it, it's supply, it's local council regulation, it's planning. And all of those issues uh, have a play in house prices. Um, but the big issue is what's happening with the currency, what's happening with the money supply. And obviously for libertarians, you know, big followers of Ron Paul who learnt about, you know, von Mises and when Ron Paul ran in the 2008, 2012 campaign and was educating about the, about the need for sound money. I mean, if you go to any Australian university, you're taught the Keynesian, you know, crap and you're not actually taught, um, you know, what is the role, what is money um, and how does money affect economic activity 
and how does that actually lead to the boom bust cycle? So, so this is the great sort of lesson of, you know, the Ron Pauls, the Peter Schiffs, who predicted the GFC before the GFC actually came about in, in terms of the US. And so, um, so yeah, so all of those lessons that the von Mises schools, um, and you know, f- you know, from the right libertarian, but also the Minsky's um, fr- fr- from from the center left. I mean, they all have a Minsky's. You know, can you uh, just explain? Uh, sure, sure. So, 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 so Minsky was an economist in the sixties and seventies who basically said that the banks are naturally are inherently in state, uh, like, uh, like uh, they are inherently unstable because banks want to make profit, and because they want to make profit, they're going to um, lend too much money out into the economy, and that creates you know systemic risk right through the uh, right through the system until it crashes. So the the libertarians will look at the money supply and saying that excessive money creation and pushing that money through the banking system is the issue. And the and the Minskians say it's the banks. So 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 both uh, look at the same problem from slightly do two different angles, but both have legitimate points of view. And obviously, the Minsky um, um, remedy is to put in structural reform to the banking system to make to ensure that there is uh, not the sort of risky behaviour that we saw in the lead up to the global financial crisis. Whereas the von Mises crowd says, you know, you've got to actually have sound money. And so I've got a few charts here that I'd love to go through that actually illustrates mainly the von Mises thesis um, about what's really been happening um, since 19, for the last 27 years, since 1991 till today. And monetary policy, it's often the forgotten economic uh, factor. As it's, it's good that you mentioned uh, the, the Ron Pauls and the, the Peter Schiffs who have been ta- talking about uh, monetary policy because both in the, the United States and Australia, we've seen uh, interest rates uh, slashed. It's, it's changing a bit in the, the United States. Now, low interest rates, if you know the, the Austrian uh, business cycle theory, is that if you allow all uh, cheap, uh, cheap credit and uh, increase the, the the money supply, then that leads to a mal investment. And right. to, to go back to the the housing uh, issue, that's that's where a lot of the the cheap money goes goes into housing because it's a it's a capital uh, I- expense. It's it's obviously uh, what most people uh, aspire to, and uh, and that's also how inflation is hidden as well. The the, the fact that all this house prices are going astronomical while everything else is well inflation happens through the the cpi but it's it's hidden because of because of this uh housing house prices well yes so so, so so there's a couple of points to unravel there so so the first point is what is inflation so um you know one of the big dilemmas in parliament um you know whether it's you know particularly when i was in the coalition side sort of six years ago when i was advising sandinus is the government officially says that inflation is low, and yet the polling that the, the parties do internally says that the number one economic issue in Australia is the cost of living. So, so, so how do you have this dichotomy between what the government is officially saying and what the Australian people are saying back to the politicians via the, via the, via the polling? And so he, he, here's a basic graph that, uh, that, that, that I've produced, and this is, um, the, you know, so, so I'll, I'll hold it like this. So, so it's basically the growth of broad money versus the cpi and this has gone back to march of 1991 and the growth the the growth uh, the broad money has grown by seven and a half percent per annum whereas the cpi has only grown by 2.44 percent per annum and so uh, you've got a 5% difference. So, so this is what has happened with money, this yellow line, and what has happened with prices is happening in this gray line, noting that the CPI doesn't include all prices in the economy. Uh, for example, things like housing and land are not in the CPI, uh, also financial assets as well. But also, um, the throughout the course of, of these 27 years, the ABS, as well as with other uh, statistical agencies in the Western world, have rigged the st- statistics by including methodological changes changes which have led to the underestimation of, of of inflation so so what i've been saying to politicians is well if you go back to the traditional pre-keynesian understanding of what inflation is which is what ben Mises said is uh it is the growth of money inflation is you inflate money you don't inflate prices the consequence of inflating money is that prices go up and so the cpi said that some prices have gone up but obviously well the question is well where has this credit gone now where where did the credit go the credit went 
like you said, in the Australian case, it went into housing. So this is this is a statistic that I sort of uncovered, and I was probably one of the first people in the country to find this. So at the last recession, uh, credit to housing as a proportion of the GDP was above 20%, and today it's above, uh, it's about 96%. So, so we've had this massive concentration of this, all this money printing that's gone into Australian housing, whereas basically in this chart, credit to business as a proportion of the economy has stayed flat for 27 years and proportion to what, they, what the RBA refers to as other personal, which is non-mortgage debt, has remained flat for 27 years. So, so when, when, when the central bank, when the RBA puts out the statistics about when they print the credit, where does it go? Um, business and other personal has grown consistently with the with economic growth, but housing has gone off the Richter scale from twenty from about twenty two percent at the last recession to ninety six percent today, and 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 that and that is what um, that that that's, that is the bubble. I mean, anyone who says there's no no bubble, that is the evidence of the bubble. You've got this massive concentration in of credit in the housing sector relative to the size of the economy, and, and this is completely unsustainable because it's the low interest rates. And the quantitative easing around the world that has led to this artificial um, ability for households to leverage up to the hilt, which if you normalize interest rates back to their long term average, uh, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of Australians would, would default on their debts because, because, you know, I mean, 80% of the market uh, as of November last year is on variable interest. So if rates went up two, three, four percent, most people would struggle to be able to make these repayments because they're already stretched at the moment. So, 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 so with all of this, that with all of this malinvestment and this misallocation of capital that we should refer to before, which which the data shows, basically what I've been saying to politicians is we've got these massive structural uh, uh, imbalances in the economy, whether it's high house prices, high household debt, net foreign debt above a trillion dollars, and we're at about fifty six percent plus of 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 GDP. And if you look at the savings ratio since the last GFC, saving, household savings has gone down. And the national account two weeks ago came out and said that the household savings was at 2.1%, which is the lowest level since December of 2007. So think about it. So household debt is going up, uh, people are being squeezed, household savings is going down at a time when Australia's got the biggest bubble in its history. And, the, and we're in, with a backdrop of we've got the biggest bubble in the history of the world because you've got 80 trillion uh, more debt uh, in terms of global debt, and then you look at you know the Chinese have got the biggest sort of non-government uh, bubble um, in the world. You know, the, uh, back in uh, February when I published an article on News.com, the U.S. stock market had valuation levels above 1929 levels. A number of the housing markets uh, in in the U.S. are above. Uh, the valuations in the lead up to subprime um, in a number of state governments in the US are completely broke like Illinois the federal government's at 21 trillion the Italians are completely sort of uh, screwed over as well in terms of uh, in terms of their debt so so this is a basically ticking time bomb um, that policymakers either are asleep to or they don't want to address and so part of what I've been trying to do is write a series of columns to explain to policymakers and to the ordinary about that because you think to yourself you know the average mom and dad who's just going to work who listens to the mainstream media listens to the prime minister the prime minister saying where well, it's great it's jobs and growth nothing to worry about well who's actually got looking after their interests to say that if something blows up um you know and and they you know they get wiped out they lose their house they lose their livelihood etc who's looking after that person the reality is no one's looking after that person. So I guess I felt a responsibility knowing what I know is to put my perspective out in the mainstream media. And I've been fortunate with News Limited that they've been giving me a platform to voice these concerns so that so that I can actually educate and wake up ordinary mums and dads and saying things are not like what the government tells you um, and, and you need to actually take uh, you know, alert and attention of, of where things potentially can go. And so Monday of this week, I published like my latest uh, 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 article in which I outlined effectively six scenarios of where we are, from where we are today, six catastrophes are likely to happen. Um, and, and it depends on whether we uh, raise rates. So think of it mathematically, we've got the biggest uh, mathematical, mathematically debt bubble in the world. If you raise rates, debt servicing costs will go up. You've got a globally financially integrated uh, system and at some point in the system someone's going to say they're going to default and then typically those defaults will cascade into a big event a 
big corporation, a bank, a government says, I can't pay my debts, and that melts down the market. So that's what, so that's basically scenarios one to three. And then you also have, if they decide, well, we're going to keep the bubble intact, they've got to keep on printing debt money, quantitative easing, to keep the bubble going. And that's ultimately going to lead to uh, the money being worthless. And this is runaway inflation, stagflation, or, or a global currency crisis. So, you know, for those who want to sort of know a little bit more about um, uh, about those different scenarios, uh, I encourage them to go to news.com and, and look at the, uh, you know, the John Adams uh, Six Pathways to Economic Armageddon, which was published uh, on Monday of this week. Uh, and the, we'll link to all of your uh, articles in the in the show notes page. So if people want to want, want to know more, they can uh, uh, go right to it. Now, there's obviously two. Uh, policy solutions to this uh, r runaway uh, inflation. You can either just keep interest rates low, print more money, quantitative easing, uh, see how f far you can you, you, you can take this uh, f uh, policy, or you can put an end to it and put up uh, hi uh, higher interest rates, yep. and then. Yep. But it obviously causes an economic uh, recession. It's it's painful. Yeah. Uh, a lot of people do lose their jobs, uh, lose their their homes. But it allows uh, the economy to to reset and to investments to be made uh, correctly. But the longer you delay that uh, uh, that policy solution, then the 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 consequences, the the downturn, the more brutal it is. Absolutely, absolutely, and, and so you know, the, you know, I mean, look, without sort of naming names, there are. It's fair to say, within the coalition in Canberra, there are people on the back bench who do not believe what their own prime minister and their own treasurer are saying. So the PM and treasurer are saying jobs and growth, everything's fine. A number of MPs are deeply concerned about where things are going. They believe my analysis. They they basically say there's a there's a fraction there's a fracture between what Morrison's putting out there and what the backbench actually believe. Um, and, and there's a whole range of you know logical political reasons for inertia, no action. But you know, I had a conversation with a senator last uh, last Thursday, and you know, he, the, all sorts of reasons for why they don't want to take action for political expediency, all of this sort of stuff. And and I said at the end of the conversation, so basically what you're saying to me is we're going to sail into the iceberg until we hit it. And you know, the senator got defensive, but he didn't say it was wrong. But so 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 so, so yes, yeah, so, so so I mean I mean I mean, I mean that, that that is that is the dilemma because yes, if you raise rates. Um, you know, think about. I mean, so the first thing is, the P, the, the the PM and the Treasury set the economic narrative in the budget, um, and you know, obviously, if the government changes its economic narrative, it's going to confuse the voters. Say, well, you said it was great, now you're saying it's not so great. So why is there the difference? So that's you know, point number one. Point number two is, you know, they don't want to spook the markets. Um, although I was pointing out that in 1986, Paul Keating actually did spook the markets when he had the John Laws interview and said we're headed towards a banana republic, that it actually did crash the markets temporarily, uh, but it actually focused the public's attention on the balance of payments crisis, and that gave Keating the political capital to push reform through the 1986 budget. So spooking the markets is, in and of itself, could be in a political advantage if it's done the right way. And Keating had the template in 86 to show us the right way. But I guess the other thing is, you know, the coalition's down, 34 news polls where they've lost. They need to pick up more um, swing voters. Uh, a number of these swing voters, particularly in the 20 to 40 demographic, you know, the cost of living is, you know, big for them. They're massively squeezed with debt. Um, and wages are not, are, not, are not growing as quickly as what the government would like. And so the correct uh, response that the Austrians would say, which is to raise interest rates, which I've told these politicians, you know, there are other things that you can do uh, other than raising rates. There's tax policy, welfare policy, and a few other things that I've advocated for. But the, 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 the big elephant in the room is interest rates. But if you raise interest rates going into election season, you, you're going to financially squeeze the very voters that you need to actually win the election. And so because they want to win, uh, they're not willing to actually um, push forward with the right, and this I'm talking about the backbench here, they're not willing to advocate for the right policy approach, even though it's good public policy. It's it, it's bad politics, given that we're up to election mm. season. So so he, you've got this dichotomy between what's right and then and, and what will actually work in the political context. And, 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 and these things that, even if they front it up to the Australian people and actually explain the problem, and then still had to squeeze them by raising rates, they would lose the election. Um, now, I think because of 
because of how poor the economy is going in terms of cost of living, uh, I think they're likely to lose anyway. So it's likely if you're going to lose, well, you might as well try to do the right thing, you know, as you go out the door. But 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 but, but that's kind of where we are in the political context. Uh, it's amazing what uh, backbenchers will tell you privately. <laughs> you wouldn't believe how many times I've heard uh, that from a, a lot of people. Um, and it's... Although, look, uh, one thing I should say is I want to give a shout out to Tim Wilson. So Tim Wilson, in, in the tw I think the 28th of February, was the first member of the coalition to break ranks with the PM and the Treasurer. And he gave an adjournment speech where he, quote, said, uh, all the warning signs are there. He referred to he referred to me on the record. He referred to a number of the metrics that I've cited in a number of my columns, uh, and, and he referred to a number of other things. And he did say that we need to come up with a policy framework that would allow for interest rates to go up. So, so Tim, you know, t t Tim has been courageous in being uh, able to put the right message out there, um, but uh, but obviously he's the sort of sole voice in the wilderness so far. Obviously, in Australia, we have the yeah. The, the Reserve Bank of Australia is uh, independent from government. It's been set up that way uh, si uh, since the, the, the 90s. And so um, wh uh, with that in mind, should, should that change at all? Uh, be or you talked about the, the other fiscal ways that uh, the government can uh, control this crisis uh, are you able to give more more detail on that and sure sure so 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 think about tax policy so you got 50 grand you go put it in a term deposit the tax system requires you to pay marginal tax on the interest uh that you earn from the savings whereas if you took that 50 grand bought investment property and borrowed you get a tax deduction on on that interest so so you, there are tax incentives to borrow and to get into debt and to invest but if you actually actually save your money in the bank then you get hit with full taxation and so 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 there are things in the tax system which which actually are driving certain incentives and certain behaviors and this is what i've said that you know rather than just looking at cutting taxes which is the current debate and obviously i think uh, today we've had the parliament pass the pm's uh, tax cuts uh, you know you actually have to do genuine tax reform by changing the incentive structure within the, within the tax code that's actually going to encourage people to save um, um, and, and obviously, you know, uh, uh, and obviously not to, 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 in order to leverage up. So, so that's obviously one, one thing. Another thing is, is, um, uh, now, I, well, actually, before I get to onto welfare, one interesting thing is, is that just before coming here today, I met with a couple of economists who wrote a book last year, basically saying that we're headed towards, uh, you know, a balance of payments sort of crisis that the current currency is going to crash because we're going to default on our foreign debts. And so they wrote a book called Credit Code Red. Uh, a couple of economists in their 70s have so been in the game for 40 years, um, highly experienced people, and we had a we had a fantastic conversation. And one of the things they talked about is a study they did in the early 90s that showed that once poker machines became very prevalent in Australian society, household savings substantially reduced. So the relationship between gambling and actual people willing to actually save their money, there is a causential relationship there. And these guys did a study about it. So I'm trying to get a handle, uh, trying to get a copy of that study that they did back in the 90s and saying, well, what relevance of, of it is today? But on welfare, so Alan Greenspan, when he was the US uh, Federal Reserve Chair, uh, you know, put out a study that, that basically said that the more welfare a, a government pro provides it to its people, the less incentive the, for the people to actually save money uh, and, 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 the, and the lower the, the savings is. So you think to yourself, if I don't have to save for my health care, if I don't have to save for, for my education, um, if I don't have to put money for a rainy day uh, because I may lose my job or I don't have to save for my retirement because I've got the pension, well, what is the incentive to save? And so, so, so the, one of the consequences of the, of the Australian welfare state is it actually provides the disincentive to, to save. And this is why, we're, why we've got relatively low uh, saving rates in this country. But the, you know, the libertarian, the capitalist, the Austrian school of economics is economic growth is driven by savings and investment. And so we've had chronically low savings for a long time in this country. And so you know, to actually get savings up, you know, it, it's a multi-pronged approach. Uh, but you know, all of this requires, uh, you know, you know it, it's politically tough. It requires political capital. It takes a lot of explaining to do in trying to convince uh, ordinary voters that there is a problem and that tough reform needs to ne needs to happen. But unlike the whole Keating Howard Costello years, the current politician has lost the 
appetite for the tough conversation. So, so you know, so is it is it a question of the politicians not being up to the job, or is it the Australian people not up not willing to be up to the conversation? I mean, it, it, you know, there's, there's there's a bit of a debate yeah. on both sides. A lot of that. people also blame the the twenty four hour media cycle and that you propose a, a big idea. There's all this backlash on uh, social media. It gets ruled off the table. The uh, the next day, when you mentioned uh, Paul, uh, Paul Keating, there was. Uh, difficult reform that he put through as, as treasurer and uh, prime minister caused a lot of, uh, uh, cost him a lot of his political capital, but mm -hmm. he managed to, to, get, uh, to get it done. Do you think that still can be done in today's day and age? Well, yes. Yeah, so, 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 so I do believe that, that it can be done. Uh, and, you know, when you talk about the immediate social media reaction, I mean, I think what's important to recognize is, is that Trump broke that model. I mean, I mean, I mean, what Trump has been able to do in the US is to say, well, you know, there's a certain segment of the population that's going to continue to jump up and down. And when it's a conservative libertarian um, or, or, or a sort of anti-establishment right winger, it, it's the it's the typical sort of people who 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 jump up and down, and they may represent five or ten percent of the population. So so why should you uh, you know succumb to that what I would call fake pressure because it's only coming from a very micro proportion of the population. So 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 so, so I I think you know the the current politicians in Australia they need to get a backbone and they need to look at what Trump has done. He's taken on the media. I mean, if you even if you go back to some of the clips of Margaret Thatcher, Thatcher would never accept the premise of the question. If a journalist asked the wrong question, she would correct the question and give the right answer. And even when she done Q and A's with the audience, I mean, she had a notepad, she had a pen, she took the question seriously, and if if she would see that the uh, voter was saying something false to her, she would correct the voter. Well, which which politician is willing to take on voters today in, in a live, um, uh, like you know, live forum, national forum, all of that sort of stuff? So no, I mean, I mean, yeah, all of this is all about persuasion. It's all about convincing. Uh, and it's all about pushing forward with the argument. And we just need. I mean, I'm a big advocate. If I was PM today, the first thing I would do, I would cut parliamentary pay by forty percent. <laughs> that would be popular immediately. <laughs> well, it'd be popular in the, among the people, obviously just popular with or unpopular with the, with the politicians. But I really believe that the amount of parliamentary pay that the cabinet minister is getting is actually acting as a disincentive for them to take risks. Most of these politicians can't get four hundred thousand dollars in the private sector, so it's like, well, I'm on this good wicket. I've got, you've got staff, I've got travel, I've got four hundred thousand coming in a year. Why would I want to rock the boat when I've got this great deal? So what you want to do is you want to cut the pay, and you want to basically say, if you want money, go out there and earn your money by producing goods and services, innovating in the economy. If you actually want to serve the Australian people, serve, serve the national interest, you know, yes, you will get paid, but it's not going to be outrageous. I mean. Uh, parliamentary pay in the British system only came in 1911 and and, uh, and the reason and I think it started off at 400 pounds and the reason why they started to pay MPs was because working class people in in UK wanted you working class representation and 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 the working class people couldn't actually serve in Parliament because they didn't actually have the you know any assets to actually fund their to, to, to fund themselves to actually be a parliamentarian whereas in the 19th century with the landed gentry these guys were wealthy they didn't need an income and they served in parliament for free and so once you started getting reform and working class people going into parliament they go well we can't do what the rich people do so we need a wage so th this is the per this is the per this is the purpose why we pay politicians and in the Australian case I mean it's just gone out of control these politicians are way paid way too much they don't want to take any risks they're on a good wicket and at the same time whether it's the economy whether it's education whether it's health care um, or a whole range of other factors the country's going backwards so, so that's you know there has to be a major reform in the political system now the Australian government can only do uh, so much we are living in a globalized world now and uh, these uh, you mentioned uh, in your uh, news.com.au articles that uh, there's a heavy debt of foreign governments household and uh, non-financial firms and that could even if we we did take preemptive action here in Australia that would still uh, significantly uh, damage our economy here regardless exactly exactly yeah so, so, so the thing is we can only control what we can control so 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 I, I agree with the premise that there are massive structural imbalances in, in across the world globally as well as in major economies so so i guess what i've been trying to say is well uh you know rather you know if we do nothing and then the world blows up well uh we are going to suffer you know quite quite a bit of damage 
but obviously if we can do things be, before so 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 the wave the hit the international shock it's coming i mean it's, it's unavoidable um in the history of humanity you're not going to have the biggest bubble in the history of the world and and, and, and the world's not going to blow up the world's going to blow up at some point uh, whether it's hyperinflation or whether it is a you know a massive default and, and a financial crisis so the question is well how are we as a country as a government as as a citizenry prepared for that shock because if we're complacent if we do nothing if we allow our uh, our bubble to keep on growing then then we are going to suffer maximum damage whereas if we actually try to do a few preemptive things about it well we can alleviate some of the damage but i agree the world's going to blow up we can't actually prevent that but we can uh limit and protect uh how much damage these string people are exposed to well, let's go through some of the the possible crisis that that, that could occur because uh, the audience, uh, some of it might be going over their their, their heads at the moment. So, uh, a currency crisis. Can you explain what what that would entail? Sure, sure. So, so a currency crisis is basically when a when when a country has massive foreign debts. And they and they basically can't pay their debts, and and the international community loses confidence in in, in their ability to uh, meet their international obligations. Uh, the the current account blows out. Uh, the the confidence in the currency of that country collapses, um, and, and and then basically you get uh, you know you, you get runaway inflation because the currency is locally like that local currency is losing value um so 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 you know so so venezuela classic example at the moment where 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 the currency relative to the us dollar or relative to any form of major currency it's gone through the floor because people have lost confidence in the ability of the venezuelan government to actually meet their international obligations or the you know, same with the argentinians the, the the turks at the moment are, are you know the, the, i think they're the the Turkish lira has fallen by 15% this year uh, because there are concerns about the Turkish, uh, the ability of the Turkish country, the Turkish state to actually meet their international obligations. So that's typically what happens with the local currency crisis. And is it different from a, a sovereign debt uh, crisis? Yeah, so, 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 so a sovereign debt crisis is basically when the government, when, when, so, because it's all about who holds the debt. So uh, the currency crisis is when the, uh, when, when the debt is foreign debt. And you can't pay it. The, 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 the sovereign debt crisis is when the debt is the government's debt, whether it's owed to, foreignly uh, to, to international uh, borrowers or if it's owed to domestic uh, borrowers or to, to, to domestic lenders. If the government uh, goes belly up, um, then that is a sovereign crisis. And uh, we talked mainly about uh, ha the housing bubble, but there's also other uh, bubbles that are warning signs as well, such as uh, stock prices. There was the famous tech bubble in the, the, the 1990s. Everyone sees their, their stocks go up and they think that, that uh, that's a good thing, but there's actually more going on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, 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 so in, ter in terms of the stock market, so, so the stock market peaked um if you look at the you know the, the the dow jones or the s p 500 it peaked earlier this year whereas i think if you've got the russell 2000 and, and the nasdaq they're making new highs in the last fortnight so so depending on the index some of them are still making highs but when you look at the relative valuations a lot of the you know some metrics like the pe shilly index they're saying that at, you know in january it was above 1929 levels but it was still below uh, where they were with the tech boom bubble in 99, 2000. Whereas with other metrics, some people are saying that in January this year, it was at an all time record high. And it's like, well, uh, you know, uh, I mean, typically what happens is when interest rates start to go up or when bond yields start to go up on the US Treasury, then the value, you know, then the, then the valuation of these uh, shares, um, because because the, the ten year bond yield is used to calculate the value of the company, and then if the interest rate goes up, the value of the company goes down because of, of forward discounting, and then and then you 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 want to allocate a lower share price to that to that to that stock, and then basically you you get excessive selling. So this is why there's a little bit a lot of focus on rising bond yields, particularly in the U.S. bond market, and the ten year bond yield is 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 of most focus because that's the most uh, heavily used uh, bond yield uh, in terms of a benchmark. An area which even I struggle to understand is the the uh, area of derivatives. Uh, the, uh, you talked about a derivative uh, bubble. So can you try and uh, uh, un unpack this uh, sure. area of finance for sure. us? Sure. So, so, so basically a derivative is taking 
a effectively a bet that that a price of something is going to go up or down so so over the most of the over-the-counter derivatives in, in, in the in the financial system so i think as of uh december last year there was about 532 trillion i think from memory of derivatives in the global financial system the big majority of them have to do with interest rates a big chunk of them have to do uh, with exchange rates as well and then you've got um positions and a whole bunch of things and these are effectively gambles of uh is is interest rates going to go up is interest rates going to go down um and, and obviously if uh certain events happen and you've got a, ma a massive amount of bets one way or the other well if, if you've bet that rates are going to go down and then they go up in order to cover your position you then have to start buying the alternative part of the the trade and that and that actually you know zooms up interest rates in order so, so that you don't actually go bust because you've got to actually make up your position. So, so, so one classic example of this is, so, so this is actually what happened last month in Italy, and this is something I've been showing politicians is, so you had political instability when the uh, when the coalition between the uh, when the league uh, and the and the five star movement started putting ministers to the Italian president, the Italian president started rejecting certain ministers for the prime ministership and the finance minister, and then they said, well, political instability has hit. Um, ha has basically hit Italy. So in two and a half weeks, the yield on the two-year Italian bond yields rose 2,000% from negative 1.38% to 2.738% uh, in two and a half weeks. And a lot of that is because of derivatives, because people took certain bets, uh, and, 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 then, and then because people um, uh, you know, lost confidence uh, you know, because, of, because of these political events and political instability, then, then, then the market started to move with all of these bets uh, happening. So, so, so these derivatives create a lot of risk you know, uh, and, 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 and they create a lot of uh, uh, leverage where, where markets and prices can move up and down depending on how these bets are structured. Now, uh, obviously, uh, this area of uh, economics, the, the economic uh, Armageddon, that's your main area of commentary uh, yeah. at the moment. But you also uh, do quite a bit of political analysis as well, as I mentioned on the on the Spectator sure. uh, Australia. And you've been quite critical of, or you've already been <laughs> critical in this interview of the current uh, political leadership. But um, do, you, do you believe that Malcolm Turnbull has been a failure as Prime Minister? He absolutely has. Uh, I mean, he was... Uh, I mean, uh, so going back three weeks before the last election, I was on, you know, I wrote a, telly, a piece for the telly, I wrote a piece for the drum, and I thought, I, and I forecasted that he wouldn't last the term. And what I said at the time was, because uh, I looked at the campaign, there was no big ideas in the campaign, it was very soft media appearances, that he was not arguing for a mandate. And it goes back to the theory of, well, what, what's the purpose of the election? Is it to win or is it to establish a mandate so you can govern? Um, and, and, and so, you know, the, the big debate when I was uh, working in opposition in the Liberal Party was, um, he, look at Houston, he went for the mandate and he lost. And so, so, and, and, and so what was the purpose? Because uh, if you don't win, you can't do anything. So, so the whole mentality in the current coalition is it's all about winning, winning at all costs, saying what you have to believe in order to win, no matter what the repercussions are for governing. Uh, you know, if you win, you, you sort all of those things afterwards. And so this is what we saw in the campaign. Um, you know, soft media appearances or fluff, no mandate, no debate, saying what he said, you know, in, in order for him to win. So he wins. And basically in two and a half years, it's, it's been a basically do nothing government, very little, little reform. The underlying metrics, when you look at the, when you look at the economy, when you look at um, health, like the health, the population health of the country, when you look at um, innovation, when you look at education, it's all going backwards. So, 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 you know, no one can say that the country is actually advancing uh, on a whole range of metrics. The actual country is actually going backwards. And this is because you've got, you know, a weak political leadership, uh, you know, basically starting at the top. I mean, Turnbull, you know, when he was a Sydney grammar at high school, he used to go walk around and say, I'm going to be prime minister. I mean, when I used to walk around at high school in the playground, we used to talk about the footy, uh, going to a public school in the Illawarra, and this guy's walking around saying, I'm going to be PM. So this is all a vanity exercise. It's all about him wanting to be um, prime minister. He b believes he's born to rule. This is sort of, you know, a long-term fantasy of his. And now that he's got it by stabbing Abbott in the back, 
um, you know, he doesn't know what to do with it because he, he never he never wanted the job for a purpose. He just wanted it to fulfill um, the, the, this, this heavenly uh, mission that he's been, you know, he believes, that he, you know, he's been commissioned by God to rule and you know, he, he's been anointed and all of this sort of garbage. And so, you know, when you have political leadership that has no purpose, it goes nowhere. And this is what we've seen for two and a half years. Now you've had in the budget, you've had these massive tax cuts, the personal income tax cuts, you've had the corporate tax cuts being announced, uh, you know, obviously, you know, like in terms of last year's budget and, and, and you know, the, the personal income tax cuts. I mean, I'll go told in December that Turnbull believes um, that he can cut, he can offer tax cuts to the Australian people and win the election uh, in a cynical vote buying exercise. Now we see today that the tax cuts have been passed by parliament, uh, but I suspect, uh, and, and a few other people in the coalition actually agree with this pro proposition as well, that this cynical play ain't gonna work. So, so you know, news poll changed the methodology. So they changed the way the preferences were allocated. And so I, can, I think two news polls ago, it was 51, 49, uh, you know, coalition within striking distance, turn was back, all of this sort of stuff. You look at the last news poll where they've gone backwards, it's now 48, uh, 52 uh, towards Labor. And so, so I, I think there's a, a number of structural problems with the economy um, and a whole range of other factors that's going to prevent Turnbull from winning. Um, so, and there are a few people in the coalition who believe they're going to lose. Some people think, some people think they have a fighting chance. Uh, uh, but, but I think if, if Turnbull was to win, it's not because he deserves to win. It's because Shorten is so bad of an option. <laughs> yeah. um, and and so, so one of the things I've sort of said to, because uh, you think about what happened in 83, uh, Fraser announced his election in the morning. And then in the afternoon, they sacked the, the Labour leader and put Hawke in. And Hawke was popular, obviously. There. Now, the Labour doesn't have a Hawke person now but if labor changed their leader to oh, Alvin else, easy is considered the, the more popular person but it's very difficult for labor to change the leader now uh true true so so, so there's two points there so if, if 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 they brought albo in he doesn't have the liabilities that shorten does particularly in terms of the union pass so i think a lot of those negatives goes away and then labor's uh, 2pp will go actually up relative to the current position uh, in terms of can they change the leadership um you, you know I mean, what what I think should happen is uh, someone should go tap Bill on the shoulder and saying, well, it, you know, at some point, it doesn't look like you're going to win for the good of the ALP. Um, step aside, uncontested election, uh, we'll put one person up and you can be a senior minister in the next government. Um, so that'd be the responsible thing to do. Now, some people think saying that Shorten will never do that. Even if he, lo if he, even if he knows he's going to lose the election, he'll go down with the ship. I mean, I mean that that seems pretty selfish for me. But there is, you know, if it's about him, if it's about Labor governing, um, it's kind of like Moses. You know, if if you can get to the edge of the promised land, but you know you can't actually get into the promised land, well, get you know pick you know pick someone else who that who who can actually take you there. So that's what I think Labor should do. Um, if if Shorten is is too um too much of a liability for for Labor to win, but uh, but some people say that that that. that 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 is not going to happen so, so 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 we'll see what happened with the politics but but you know going back to the the original sort of conversation we we're having about the armageddon i mean the, the two major parties on, on on monetary policy i mean it's identical i mean i mean there is no there is no difference and so the you know i've had some politicians say to me well in my electorate house prices like in sydney or melbourne house prices are coming down and i said well don't look at prices look at the debt and the debt continues to go up and there's no bit of evidence to me that these structural imbalances are actually unwinding. So we even haven't begun the process to um, to actually get this economy moving in the right direction in terms of in terms of this bubble. And so you know the current uh, course of action is for the bubble to continue to grow until we hit the iceberg. And it's like, well, I mean, for me, I just don't, I think that's completely poor governance. Uh, the reason that Malcolm Turnbull is uh, still Prime Minister, despite the fact he's now lost more news polls than Tony Abbott, is because the, the Liberal Party room, they feel that there's no uh, alternative to Turnbull. He's still the preferred Liberal leader, even though the public want to, to vote uh, the coalition out. And mm -hmm. they think another change would be even more traumatic than the, the first one in, in 2015. And so they're they're all united behind uh, Turnbull for now, and you're and you're right. Every time it looks like he's he's turning a corner, saying this will be the these tax cuts will be the policy that will turn his government around. It or Labor's and uh, 
uh, capital gains uh, uh, franking credits, uh, that, that'll be the, the policy that undoes him. It, it doesn't happen. It's still the, the polls are the same. Yes. So, so, so that tells me that, uh, you know, there is something more fundamental happening with, with what you know, and obviously it is this cost of living issue. This is the most pressing problem. And so some of it is manifesting in electricity prices. And obviously uh, people like Craig Kelly are focused on that with Abbott and, and others with climate change. But it is, I mean, I've told MPs as of yesterday, if you lose the election, it is because of the money. The, the, the Australian dollar has actually lost a lot of value. Um, this is where the debt has come in. People are squeezed. Uh, wages, are, you know, global interest rates are starting to rise. We've seen some of the banks have started to pass some of these costs on. Um, and, and and obviously wages are not sort of keeping up with pay. So, uh, so, so people don't feel like... They're, I mentioned like they're wages uh, in my introduction. I should probably uh, ask you, what, uh, what do you uh, what's the reason you see for the, the stagnant uh, wage growth? Oh, so, 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 so it's probably, so, so I think it'd be a, a number of factors. I mean, the first thing has to be the high level of immigration. So, so, you know, obviously if you've got more workers, you've got more competition, um, in terms of the labor market and that has a suppressing impact, uh, in terms of wages going up. So that'd be one, I mean, obviously with, with, you know, technology automation, uh, you know, a lot of uh, a lot of uh, labor is is not required like it used to be traditionally. So so there are cost saving measures that companies can employ. So if labor gets too expensive, that, you know, rather than actually people paying more, they can basically just use technology. So you know, um, you know, whether it's, it's artificial intelligence or um, scanning machines or you know um, other forms of electronic devices. I mean, businesses are willing to um, you know you know to, to, to actually invest in that capital. Um, it, you know, um, rather than actually paying workers like more money. So, 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 so there, I think, you know, I mean, there are some factors we can control, some factors we can't control, but, but, but obviously, uh, you know, uh, it's a highly competitive global labor market. Um, and, and we, we have, you know, a range of jobs we have been losing to offshore competition, uh, at the same time, we're flooding the market, flooding the country with, with immigrants. And you look at the net overseas migration, I think. I saw something like, like for the last minute, it was 286,000, um, you know, like, whereas I think Dick Smith was saying was the long-term average was like 70,000. So it's like, well, you know, can we sustain all, all, all of these people coming in? What is the impact on, on, on people being able to get a job? Because see, when, when, when Turnbull says the government has created a million jobs, well, um, a lot of that jobs growth has gone to new immigrants. Yeah, um, and the unemployment rate stays the same. <laughs> Exactly. Exactly. So, so yeah. So now, in terms in terms of challenging and, and, and the basis of challenging. So, uh, you know, the, the case you made before about uh, about uh, you know uh, we don't want to be the rug you rod, all of this sort of stuff. I mean, I've, I've heard this uh, in the press. I've heard of this privately, and I got quite you know frustrated with this. This is why, in um, in April, I wrote a column for the Spectator. And I wrote my challenge speech. I said, if I was going to challenge Turnbull as a fictional candidate, <laughs> a real candidate, I said, this is my speech. This is the clearest um, policy reason in 35 years why Turnbull should be removed. We need new leadership. I laid it all out there. If anyone's interested, they can go on The Spectator and actually look at my speech. And the funny thing is, the next day, I actually had a member of the coalition, a liberal, call me up. Uh, and said, I read your speech, fantastic speech. So even though it was a fictional candidacy, <laughs> it actually solicited real support. So I actually think if I t went to the party room, even though I'm not a member of parliament, I think I would at least get one vote. And, I, and, and, and it was just me and somebody venting my frustration at, at the leadership. Um, you know, like I, I went, you know, back to my hotel room one night, wrote, 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 wrote sort of this speech over three hours, sent to the Spectator, they published the next morning. And, uh, and yeah, and funny thing is, I did the rounds yesterday at Parliament and one of the MPs said, um, you know, I heard about your speech, but I haven't actually had a chance to read it. Can you send it to him? I said, yeah, no problem. Said, read it. And I said, use it. One of, one of the reasons why I wrote it was to say, here's a whole bunch of arguments that I think are relevant that I wanted to make in my challenge to Turnbull, but a Dutton, an Abbott, uh, uh, whoever the case may be, can use these arguments to say, well, I'm not challenging because we're down in the polls. I'm challenging because I actually want to take the government and the country in a new direction. And, and Turnbull and Morrison has been a complete abject failure for the country. Uh, yeah, the, uh, there was the famous uh, empty chair challenge. You could probably, uh, in the in the Liberal Party room, just have the chair put the speech on there and see how many votes it got. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Things like that, 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 that is a very good suggestion. I'm, I'm actually sort of doing the rounds back in Parliament on Monday. Perhaps I should take a printout of the speech and actually go to an MP and say, hey, thing is, why don't, why don't you, you know, you, you know, call a spill, empty chair, put the speech in the chair and see how many chairs, see how many um, votes the, the speech solicits. Well, John, I've really enjoyed uh, chatting with you. It's been a really uh, stimulating uh, discussion. I think uh, everybody hopes that uh, uh, you're uh, not right, but uh, the, the economy is a, is a beast uh, all on its own. Uh, well done on putting all this uh, work together for the past uh, uh, 18 months and uh, good luck with the future. Beautiful. And, uh, and yeah, look, so, so I should have a column hopefully coming out maybe in the next uh, 48 hours, uh, which is basically my 10 point plan of how people should prepare for the coming economic Armageddon. So if anyone's interested, look out on news.com and, and, and they'll be able to sort of catch my 10 point plan. All right, everybody, that's the show for today. Tickets are still on sale for the big tour by Stefan Molyneux and Lauren Southern in Australia this July. They'll be visiting Sydney, Melbourne, Adelaide, Perth and Brisbane, as well as Auckland. The tour is being hosted by new events company Axomatic Events, and to book your place, please visit axomatic.events. Another big name coming down under is former UKIP leader Nigel Farage. This September, he's visiting Sydney, Melbourne, Adelaide, Perth, Brisbane and Auckland as well. It is being brought to you by the same people who brought you Milo Live last year. Tickets, including various VIP passes, can be booked at nigellive.com.au. Also, don't forget, if you want to take the Unshackled to the next level and score some awesome rewards in the process, please consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash the Unshackled. Don't forget, we have our online store, Upright Market, where you can purchase Unshackled merchandise and other gear for right-thinking people. So thanks once again for your company, and we'll see you next time. Thanks for tuning in to The Unshackled Waves. Please visit theunshackledwaves.net for all the ways to subscribe and follow the show. Don't forget to pick up your free ebook at theunshackledbattlefield.net and keep checking out theunshackled.net for all the latest news and commentary.